Welcome to our CVRTI, or, or welcome to our CVRTI seminar series. Today we have a, a, a guest from within the University of Utah, um, Candace Reno Bernstein, um, is a young investigator, research assistant professor. Who uh, several years ago I had the opportunity to work with her. She she did a, a whole slew of the rat isolated perfused heart studies in my lab and 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 uh, we were able to look at some interesting things so i'm excited to get an update on on her current work um just before we start into her talk next week we we have uh genie uh sung from virginia commonwealth um, university will be here as our speaker and so uh look forward to her talk next week um and then we'll reconvene in, in january um just by way of inter introduction for, for Candace, uh, she did her uh, undergraduate and, and master's degree at California State University in biology, then did a PhD at Washington University in St. Louis um, in molecular and cell, uh, cell biology. Uh, then she did a postdoc at, at Yale and then came to the University of Utah as a postdoc. And, uh, Several years ago, 2020, became a research assistant professor. Um, and here she's uh, working on, on getting grants and moving her, her, her program forward. She, she was awarded an R56, which is a, 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 a great award, especially for early stage young investigators to, to get some additional data. Um, and she's got a very interesting story with hypoglycemia and, and arrhythmias, and particularly with um, um, changes in, in diabetes that occur. Um, and with that, we're very excited to hear you talk and we'll have her speak and then questions and answers primarily at the end. Thank you, Candace. Yeah, thank you for your introduction. Um, and uh, thank you all for being here and listening to my talk. Um, as you can tell, like the title of my talk was Mechanisms of Hypoglycemia Induced Cardiac Arrhythmias in Type 1 Diabetes. I, I can figure it out. It's okay. <laughs> Got it. All right. Um, so just kind of a quick outline of what I'm going to talk about today. Just a one slide intro on the latest stats of how big of a problem diabetes actually is. Then I'm going to talk about hypoglycemia, which is a problem with the treatment of diabetes, and how this is a clinical problem, um, and how we have ways to defend against it. Good. Um, and then I'm going to talk about how this can lead to mortality, and our animal model is going to be the, the point where I, I spend most of my time today, and then a quick little um, current direction thing with some um, actually unpublished data. So diabetes, just latest stats from 2022 CDC website is now there is 37.3 million people in the U.S. alone with diabetes. That's 11.3% of the population, a lot. And undiagnosed is actually a big problem too. 8.5 million people do not know that they have diabetes. So, um, and part of that also is pre-diabetes. 96 million people 18 years and older have pre-diabetes, meaning they're not diabetic yet. Um, sometimes lifestyle changes can help prevent that. And more uh, interesting for this group is that 23 to 33% of people with type 2 diabetes in particular have cardiovascular disease. And in 2021, diabetes was the eighth leading cause of death in the US, and that's down from number seven just because of COVID now being number three. So just again, a quick um, brief, what is type 1 and type 2 diabetes in case somebody here doesn't know the difference between the two. Type 1 diabetes is when the pancreas is unable to secrete insulin. And this leads to a rise in blood glucose versus type two, which is what you're probably more familiar with, um, where the pancreas can secrete insulin. It secretes too much insulin and there can become resistance in the tissues and also leads to a rise in blood glucose. So I focus on type one diabetes. Um, I'm interested in type two diabetes. It's just a lot to study at once. So I'm just focusing on one at a time. And um, the main treatment for type one is giving insulin back as an injection. And insulin has now been around for over 100 years. This is discovered in 1920, and this is uh, Banting and Best in the picture with one of the dogs that they used to discover insulin with. A uh, huge discovery, it saved lives, as you uh, probably know. But one thing with um, insulin was they discovered that, great, it lowers blood sugar levels, 
but sometimes it does it too much. And this is actual graph from their lab notebook showing glucose levels dropping. And sometimes they drop so low, they had to give the dogs orange juice to be able to recover from that low glucose. So insulin is a great life-saving tool to control diabetes. Um, however, hypoglycemia seems to be a, a pretty big problem. And so I'm gonna talk about how much of a problem this is clinically. Um, it is the rate limiting factor in the glycemic management of diabetes. It can cause recurrent morbidity in most people with type one and in many with advanced type two. It can sometimes be fatal. Some stats for people with type one diabetes, it is more common because insulin is more common at causing hypoglycemia. On average, people with type one have um, two episodes of hypoglycemia per week and severe hypoglycemia one to one point seven episodes per patient year. So they experience quite a bit of hypoglycemia. Some experience multiple episodes a day even. So the barrier of hypoglycemia does preclude this maintenance of normal glucose over a lifetime of diabetes. So just how big of a problem is it? Um, hypoglycemia versus hyperglycemia. Hyperglycemia is also a big problem, right? If you have hyperglycemia for too long, it can cause all sorts of problems, including cardiovascular disease. But this is looking at hospitalization rates over years on the y axis or on the x axis. For hyperglycemia in orange, you see it declines over the years because we're getting better glucose control in people with diabetes. However, the blue line here is hypoglycemia hospital admissions. And even, I know this is a little bit outdated, but even today, it's still pretty um, flat line. It's pretty normalized. It's, it's not really declining as much as we would like. So hypoglycemia still remains a really, really big problem. So that's become the biggest um, thing clinically is how do we prevent the macro and microvascular complications of diabetes, but also prevent hypoglycemia. So one such study was called the ACCORD trial. It's the action to control cardiovascular risk in diabetes. They were um, basically trying to lower their, their glucose, to get them under better control so they wouldn't have any cardiovascular disease. Um, and so this is looking at A1C on the y-axis. And for those that don't know, the normal A1C for someone without diabetes is five. So everybody started out around um, eight in the group. They divide them into two groups, one with standard therapy of an A1C of about 7.5 and the second group of intensive therapy to about 6.5. So they're really pushing glucose control in that group. And what they found was um, the severe hypoglycemia incidence was increased in the intensive therapy group, which, was, which might've been expected. However, the deaths, there were deaths in both groups and the deaths were higher in the intensive therapy treated group, but they still were pretty significant in the standard therapy group. And they, all they could say was deaths were probably related to hypoglycemia. Can't really say for sure if you don't have a continuous glucose monitor on them and can say that they had low glucose at the time of their death. So it wasn't for sure, but they probably were. This caused the study to be halted only after three and a half years of follow-up because there are too many deaths. So, and in the end, there was no, um, no benefit to cardiovascular risk in these people with diabetes. So um, this became a big eye opener for people in the field that um, we gotta be careful with our glucose control because hypoglycemia is a major problem. So that leads me to how do we defend against it? How do we prevent ourselves from becoming hypoglycemic? Mm -hmm. So again, I, I study type one diabetes mostly. So insulin is used to lower glucose levels. Sometimes they get too low. And when they get too low, we term that um, moderate hypoglycemia. Clinically, moderate hypoglycemia is anything below 70 milligrams per deciliter of glucose. In the lab, we typically define it as between 40 and 50 milligrams per deciliter. The immediate response is to counterregulate that. Secrete hormones such as epinephrine and glucagon, they're really big hormones that are used to, to bring that glucose level back up. However, as I kind of mentioned before and alluded to that people experience multiple hypoglycemic episodes a week, a day, a year, whatever it may be. And when this happens, the long-term adaptations start to occur. Hypoglycemia unawareness occurs. So you're not aware that your glucose is 50 or even 30, um, which can be very, very dangerous because you're not doing anything to correct it. It can also lead to impaired counter-regulation. So hormones such as epinephrine and glucagon they're not secreted as much anymore and they're secreted at lower glycemic levels. So the whole body is becoming altered. This increases the risk for even lower glucose levels we term severe hypoglycemia. Clinically, severe hypoglycemia is defined as needing assistance to recover from glucose. This can be anything from going to the ER or somebody walking to the fridge and grabbing orange juice for you. 
That's, that's their definition, a very loose definition. So in the lab, we define it as a glucose level of 10 to 15, very, very low. Immediate response, confusion, seizures, comas, and death. And fortunately, a lot of people do survive a severe hypoglycemic episode, but unfortunately, long-term complications such as brain damage and cognitive dysfunction can occur. Um, I kind of like this slide because at some point in my career, I've studied all of these things. So if you have any questions on these things, I can probably answer them from previous research. My research right now, though, is focused on the problem of sudden death due to severe hypoglycemia. So that brings me to talking about mortality and how this is a problem clinically. So you might be wondering how often does this actually occur clinically? And it does kill um, mortality due to hypoglycemia in young people with type one diabetes can be anywhere from six to 10%, depending on the study that was given. This is a very, um, very, uh, it's just, it's very emotional thing that JRF put on their website. This is a sad reality that young people with type one diabetes can suddenly die from low blood sugar um, and so we don't really have an exact mechanism of why this is occurring. And this is actually called the dead in bed syndrome, which is just as horrible as it sounds. Sudden unexplained death of people with type 1 diabetes overnight. No clear cause of death upon autopsy. Um, undisturbed bed, all the things. Um, and it's for accounts for over 27% of the unexplained deaths in type 1 diabetes. And this is where we get um, some case reports coming out finally where people were wearing continuous glucose monitors and they showed that severe hypoglycemia occurred overnight. So again, a young man, he was 23 years old. This is a case report where he had type one diabetes. He had that history of severe hypoglycemia. So they started him on a continuous subcutaneous glucose monitor device. I apologize, it's a little bit blurry because it's a problem getting a clear image from this paper for some reason. Um, but this is again, day one glucose levels and the black line is the continuous glucose monitor. <laughs> All the blue dots are fingerprints. Um, and then the y-axis is glucose levels and time on the x-axis. The top red line is 250 of a glucose level, which is very high. This red dashed line is 70, which is the marker for hypoglycemia. So um, as you can see, his glucose fluctuated a lot on that day. The yellow boxes down here are meals and the purple box is exercise. So when you eat a meal, your glucose rises. When um, you exercise, it, it drops a little bit, which is a known phenomenon in diabetes that exercise can, in some situations, lower glucose. And then he ate again and glucose um, spiked up to 250. So he decided to give himself a couple of boluses of insulin, which are all these purple lines here. Finger prick right before bedtime said 250. So, hey, let's give us some more insulin. Um, then he went to sleep and glucose just plummeted down. Possible areas of counter regulation here, which failed. And this is actually the first report of the dead in bed syndrome where he was found dead in his bed with a glucose of 10. Um, so severe hypoglycemia was the cause of death in this situation. And the question came out, well, why? Why does severe hypoglycemia cause sudden death? And we asked this to our colleagues several years ago now. I was a grad student when I first asked this question. No one really had an answer. What causes someone to die? Either the heart stops or you stop breathing usually are the two reasons. But what causes those things to happen? So we had many possible mechanisms, um, uh, hypoxemia, low blood oxygen, neuroglycopenia, lack of brain glucose, the catecholamines, epinephrine and norepinephrine have been shown in other settings to you know, cause cardiac arrhythmias, for instance. Um, hypokalemia, insulin drives potassium into cells. And so insulin treatment alone can cause low blood, low blood potassium, which could trigger arrhythmias. Decreased respiration and cardiac arrhythmias. Um, whole list of things. I've studied a lot of these over the years. So again, if you have questions, feel free to ask. Um, I'm gonna focus, as you can imagine by my title of the talk, on the cardiac arrhythmias. So the hypothesis we first came up was that severe hypoglycemia does cause cardiac arrhythmias. We didn't know what type at this time. We just thought it would cause some kind of cardiac arrhythmia, which led to sudden death. So this leads me to the animal model because this is very hard to study clinically. Um, we're studying sudden death due to hypoglycemia. So obviously not something you can easily study clinically. So we're using these rodents as a model. And in our lab, we use mostly rats. We have used mice, but um, rats have been our go-to model for now. And for those not familiar with a clamp, I'm gonna talk about what a clamp is because I'm gonna keep referring to it. It's a hyperinsulinemic severe hypoglycemic clamp. 
This is what we do in all of our studies where we have glucose on the y-axis. Um, in blue and yellow are typically two groups where one gets a drug infusion or one gets a control infusion. We have continuous electrocardiogram recording for the entire clamp period. We actually have these um, EKG leads made and they're placed subcutaneously in the animal. And this allows for awake, freely mobile animals with electrocardiogram recording the entire clamp. Not true telemetry because they do have a wire coming out of their back, but it's in the middle of the back, so they can't really reach it. Uh, and then we give insulin to lower glucose levels and match them and clamp them with dextrose infusion simultaneously, um, clamping them at 10 to 15 milligrams per deciliter for three hours. So this is what we do consistently in all of our studies. We just change what, um, what drugs we give. So I'm just gonna put it all up here at once because I know you guys are um, cardiac experts here. So this is a rat left a cardiogram from one of our studies. Um, very typical of what we see during our studies. Um, during euglycemia, they're in normal sinus rhythm and um, baseline heart rate's about 350 to 400 beats per minute in a rat. During hypoglycemia, we see um, all sorts of changes happening. Um, I'll, I'll mention QT prolongation because I know it's um, of interest to some people here. Uh, QT prolongation does happen. It could just be because of the insulin. It could also be because of the um, combination of insulin and hypoglycemia together. Clinically, it's important because they do use it as a marker of cardiac arrhythmias that could potentially happen. So the advantage of using the animal model, we can now see what happens while we keep them longer in hypoglycemia after they experience the QT prolongation. So we do see premature ventricular contractions, but they're not really associated with sudden death in hypoglycemia, just letting you know that they, they happen, they're there. Um, we see first and second degree heart block, and um, we see both type one and type two second degree heart block, but um, first degree heart block shown here, we see first degree heart block also by itself. Second degree heart block shown here where the QRS complex is dropped. Um, and we eventually do see this um, sinus bradycardia that's just multiple AV blocks. Sometimes they're two to one, four to one. They can get really, really increased um, in frequency. And eventually third degree heart block, which is really hard to show on a small slide, but um, you can actually kind of see it very nicely here where the arrow is pointing at the P wave. So there's the atrium contracting and then there's the ventricles, just, just complete dissociation from one another. And then lastly, we do see some VTAC and VFib. Um, you might know that rats can escape that rhythm on their own. So I'm not really sure what that means um, clinically for this, for this model, but um, third degree heart block, I'll tell you right now, has always been our major predictor of sudden death during hypoglycemia. So lots of arrhythmias can happen, but that one seems to be the major one. How come the QRSs on the third degree heart block don't look like if you can see it's stable? I mean, they're, they're ventricular, so are they looking for them? I mean, I don't know what our normal rat QRS is supposed to look like, but that like shoulder looks really myopathic. The uh, light up, uh, which, which side, the T-way side or the whole thing? The, like, the, like the whole thing. The whole thing. So, yeah, and so what's hard is, our animals are freely moving also. And I'm always wondering if some things I see are also due to a slight movement in the EKG lead and the positional thing. Cause I've seen an EKG slide and it can distort the, a little bit of the rhythm there. Um, but yeah, a third degree heart block with other things happening could be due to, um, I'm gonna allude to some of that today, um, ion imbalances or whatnot might be going on. So, so yeah, I'd love your guys' input. If you see something standing out that I may not have seen as well. It's yeah, great. it's a cool question. That was supposed to be at the end. But, uh, <laughs> may I just wait? But but while we're talking about that, so so the normal guys, normal rats. These are normal rats, yeah. Yeah, so what happens when you just watch them for the same duration um, as you've done for the apoglycemic ones? The top one happens. You get euglycemia, so, um, sinus, sinus rhythm. I've done euglycemia, so it's high insulin with normal glucose to account for the high insulin. Okay. And um, it's normal sinus rhythm. So each animal says its own control, essentially. Uh, pretty much, yeah. We do an hour of just baseline okay. readings. Okay. And but I've also done longer than an hour just to see as well. I had the same question of what happens if you hold them longer and yeah. they're just, are they yeah, stressed? Are they, we see sometimes PVCs every now and then, just sporadic ones, yeah. but nothing. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Um, the diabetic rats, they tend to have more before hypoglycemia. Okay. So there's something there. Um, and just to kind of um, side step for a second, I was showing you that arrhythmias are definitely happening during hypoglycemia, and I think they're the cause of death um, in these animal models. I just want to show you that ventilation is not the cause. So respiration is pretty normal. This is a sham control animal looking at the timeline here where zero is the start of severe hypoglycemia. 
Respiration is pretty normal. Um, our, this is our baseline respiration for rats, about 100, 120 um, breaths per minute. We count these manually. We stare at the rat breathing and count them. It's kind of, it, it works, so why not? Um, but the respirations do drop, but they don't drop so much that it's incompatible with life. Um, that's just a side effect of hypoglycemia, and these rats are sometimes going into comas, so respiration will drop. Um, we've also done ABGs on some of these animals, and so we have um, in blue the carbon dioxide levels in the blood, and red the oxygen saturation here on the um, right side axis. And during the clamp period here, you see that carbon dioxide stays pretty normal, oxygen saturation stays near 100%. It's not till the animal starts having um, these gasping episodes that they're actively dying, where oxygen saturation starts to plummet, CO2 goes up. And then the last sample, this animal's already had these arrhythmias that seem to be fatal. Um, and so I think the respiration problems happens at the very end um, after the arrhythmia has happened. So we know what uh, we know now that severe hypoglycemia does lead to these arrhythmias and can lead to sudden death. The natural question is, well, what's causing these arrhythmias? The brain has um, been highly studied in this terms of hypoglycemia. We know there's several regions in the brain that detect hypoglycemia. Autonomic innervation goes directly to the heart. So it might be natural to say that some kind of autonomic innervation to the heart is causing these arrhythmias. So just a brief uh, reminder, you know, you got the sympathetic nervous system where epinephrine is secreted and you've got the parasympathetic nervous system where acetylcholine is secreted. And um, are both arms of the autonomic nervous system working on the heart simultaneously, separately? What are they doing to maybe possibly cause these arrhythmias? And so the first thing we did was ask, well, what about just autonomic innervation altogether? And then this is where we contacted Derek. And I'll just briefly show this since he mentioned this earlier. Um, basically, we did ex vivo rat heart perfusion with Langendorf perfusions because um, you take the heart out of, an, out of an animal, you lose all the autonomic innervation. So can we now take the heart and put it in low glucose and see if there's an arrhythmia that happens? So we did that uh, also with the help of Annie. And um, we had hearts for three hours to kind of mimic what we were doing in vivo. And we had normal glucose and low glucose solutions. So no autonomic innervation. But we wanted to add back some of the autonomic inputs. So we also did the other groups whereby we had um, either epinephrine with normal glucose and low glucose, or we had acetylcholine with low glucose and normal glucose. And just looking at heart rate to show, some of you might be wondering what happens to a heart after being three hours on a Lingendorf, um, a rat heart specifically. Um, heart rate looks pretty good, um, a little bit lower than like an in, in vivo rat um, heart rate would be, but otherwise pretty, um, pretty steady. When we gave epinephrine, that's these two graphs here, this, um, this dash one and this gray one. Epinephrine did cause a rise in heart rate, but for some reason the low glucose with epinephrine started to decline and um, I might have an answer for that in a couple of slides here, but um, showing that it's getting in there and working and then acetylcholine, both groups, heart rate did decline a little bit, um, showing again that it is working. So um, we looked at survival during the three hours of these experiments and basically any heart that had a normal glucose solution survived the entire three hours. It, so epinephrine alone, acetylcholine alone, they're not really causing any arrhythmias during this three hour period. Surprisingly, low glucose alone also, I thought it might cause some kind of problem with survival, but their hearts were fine with, with that very, very low glucose solution. So it wasn't just low glucose alone, but when we gave the epinephrine um, and the acetylcholine separately with low glucose, those both caused a drop in survival. So indicating that it is part of the autonomic nervous system in combination with low glucose that's leading to arrhythmias. So we did count um, second degree heart block and looked at third degree heart block in um, as you might expect, the only groups that experienced this was the two groups that had reduced survival. So low glucose with epinephrine and low glucose with acetylcholine experienced both second and third degree heart block. Um, again, adding to our hypothesis that the autonomic innervation is what's driving these arrhythmias. So to test this, we also looked um, in vivo. And um, to study each arm separately, we started with the sympathetic nervous system because that might be the more obvious answer. Epinephrine is known in other studies such as heart failure and whatnot to be a cause of some cardiac um, arrhythmia. So we started with that simple thing doing adrenergic receptor blockade. Um, we decided to block all of them, alpha and beta adrenergic receptors. So um, we wanted to make sure we were just blocking the whole response. So we used prazosin, which is an alpha one blocker, ever panel, which is a beta one, beta two. 
We did continuous IV fusion during that three hour clamp. Remember with the rats, so three hours of severe hypo, we've got a continuous IV infusion of all these beta blockers. And I'll just jump straight to the point that completely um, prevented mortality during severe hypoglycemia, whereas control rats had about a 32% mortality. So alpha beta blockade um, is really good at preventing the severe hypoglycemia induced mortality. I was very shocked when I, when I saw how, how good it was. Um, so we looked at a couple of things. Again, I'll mention QTC, just because I know it might be of interest to some of you. Um, compared to baseline with controls in white and alpha beta blockers in black, um, compared to baseline, we do get QT prolongation in both groups. But as you might expect, the effective beta blockers, um, QT prolongation is slightly reduced compared to controls during severe hypoglycemia. So it's, it's interesting because the therapy for beta blocker overdose is to give glucagon, right? So, which would raise your sugar a lot. So, I wonder, I guess it works both ways. Or... Yeah. So, the hard part, um, maybe I should have started my talk with this. Um, there's a lot known in the cardiac field about how the autonomic nervous system innervates the heart and how it causes things. There's not a lot known about what happens during severe hypoglycemia. And so we're trying to adapt what's known in cardiology and trying to figure that out. So epinephrine might do one thing in the setting or a beta blocker might do one thing in a setting, but when you drop the glucose levels that much more, it could be a totally different phenomenon because of the physiology is changing so much. So it's, um, I am trying to use all these previous studies to, to understand the model too, but that's, things have been a little bit different with hypoglycemia. Did you try both like just beta blockers or just I'll, alpha? I'll get to that in one second. That's a great question. Um, but just to show you the heart block on this one, just a reminder what second degree heart block look like. Um, this is the incidence of heart block over severe hypoglycemia time. In black is the alpha beta blockers. Not one of them had second degree heart block. And if you follow it in controls in white, this is the incidence of second degree heart block over time. Eventually all of them have it. And if we overlay this with survival, we see that again, in black is the alpha beta blocker rats, they all survived. However, in the control rats, survival starts to decrease with the more incidence of second degree heart block. So there is an association of increased second degree heart block with reduced survival during severe head pressing. And third degree heart block, I keep alluding to this, this is the, this is the major one. Um, incidence of third degree heart block in control or alpha beta blocker infused rats. Not one of the alpha beta blocker infused rats experienced third degree heart block. I've divided the controls into lived and died just to kind of make a point here. In white, one animal lived with third degree heart block, but in black, all the control animals that died had third degree heart block. So again, kind of a, this is the same picture from before um, with third degree heart block here. And when third degree heart block happens, the animal actually stops breathing. The heart rhythm kind of looks like this or even a little bit slower with less of a, such a profound QRS looking complex. It's really, um, really different, but never get a complete flat line on mean KG. Um, the animal has stopped breathing before the heart completely stops. So the rhythmia happens, the animal stops breathing, and then um, that's when we have to call it. But yes, to get Lou to your point, what is it? The alpha blocker or the beta blocker? Uh, I had the same question. So I did the studies and alpha blocker did not have an effect. If anything, it made things worse. Um, whereas the beta blocker, even with low end values, was significant at totally preventing mortality um, due to hypoglycemia. So yes, the beta blocker is the one that is something that's great. Unfortunately, not all people with diabetes can go on beta blockers for various reasons. But so. also, you never give a beta blocker to someone who's in the second or third. <laughs> right. Never, exactly. Never. So <laughs> this is more... Um, yeah, I mean, you might do it as rats. But. Yeah, and so there are studies, actually, a guy that used to be here, he moved on to Michigan. Um, he's doing a clinical study looking at beta blockers and during hypoglycemia, actually. So it'll be interesting to see what his results are. Um, not exactly what I'm doing, obviously, because he's doing it clinically, but... Um, that that part has moved forward. So yes, mechanistically, we still need to understand what's happening so we can better find better ways to treat people uh, with diabetes. So I'm gonna then kind of do a couple more talks on the the parasympathetic studies, just because this is a little bit more counterintuitive. Why would you think during hypoglycemia the parasympathetic nervous system is kind of overactivated? Um, one thing I'll say is that we do see bradycardia during hypoglycemia. This says non-diabetic rats. We see it in the diabetic rats too. Um, on the top graph is glucose and the bottom graph, graph is heart rate. Again, heart rate normal for a rat is about 350 to 400 beats per minute. That's normal. So as glucose levels drop, um, heart rate drops. Again, zero is the start of severe hypoglycemia. This is just one example. 
but we see this in all of our studies. So, so slowing of the heart is happening in all of our animal models. And it's not just the animal models, but they're now seeing this clinically as well. Again, it's kind of counterintuitive, but a um, couple of times now, this is just one case report where someone was admitted to the hospital, glucose was 34, heart rate was 38 to 39 beats per minute. And then one hour later, they normalized glucose and heart rate was back up to 70, indicating it was the hypoglycemia that was, was causing their um, decrease in heart rate. So there is something to it. Um, hypoglycemia can cause this drop in heart rate, which may mean that there is some kind of parasympathetic stimulation to the heart or maybe a sympathetic withdrawal. I'm not really 100% sure on that. But to study that, we decided to do two ways. One was a surgical vagotomy and one was pharmacological blocking. So for surgical vagotomy, we transected the left vagus nerve um, or did a sham control surgery. And then one week later, and this is non-diabetic rats, one week later, we um, did that severe hypoglycemic clamp, which is again, you've seen this kind of picture before. It's the same thing where glucose levels are evenly matched here um, in both the sham and vagotomy rats. Um, <clears throat> so as you would expect, the heart rate at baseline in the vagotomy in green here versus control in white um, is elevated at baseline slightly. But interestingly, during severe hypoglycemia, heart rate drops to a similar extent in both groups, again. So we only transect the left vagus nerve, right vagus nerve is still intact. Maybe there's input from the right vagus nerve. Um, but again, last time I wanna show you QTC. QTC compared to baseline, increased to a similar extent in both groups. So in this study, QT prolongation is not gonna be a factor in arrhythmias during hypoglycemia. So we thought QT prolongation was gonna be a major player in the hypoglycemia-induced arrhythmias, but now more evidence is showing that QT prolongation can occur a lot when we reduce arrhythmias. So not, maybe not as a, important as we had thought previously. And again, jumping straight to the point, vagotomy worked again. Uh, vagotomy reduced mortality due to severe hypoglycemia compared to controls. So we got sympathetic and parasympathetic inputs that seem to be playing a role in mortality during hypoglycemia. And just to show you some more graphs from this study, particularly is the sham control rats with second degree heart block on the left and third degree heart block on the right. Again, try, kind of really hard to show it in there and um, changing in morph morphology again of the QRS complex itself. And similar time points for vagotomy, um, a little bit faster of a heart rate at times, heart rate does kind of go up and down. I take you know chunks, this is only milliseconds of an EKG. So um, it goes up and down, um, but we quantify this. Secondary heart block was reduced with vagotomy compared to controls. And third degree heart block was completely prevented with vagotomy compared to controls. And in this study, we looked at the sensitivity and specificity and found that third degree heart block was 83% sensitive and 100% specific at predicting mortality during hypoglycemia. So again, third degree heart block seems to be the major one when it happens, we see it going, we're like, uh oh, um, not, not a good thing. And since this is a parasympathetic nervous system we're manipulating, I wanted to show you some hormones from the sympathetic nervous system, which we always measure in our studies, epinephrine and norepinephrine in the blood. And this is looking at solid bars or basal, hash bars or severe hypoglycemia. So in all instances compared to basal during severe hypoglycemia, epinephrine and norepinephrine go up, but to a similar extent in both groups. That means vagotomy can reduce arrhythmias and prevent or reduce mortality even in the presence of high blood epinephrine. So epinephrine is not the only player here. It seems that the vagal input um, is, a, is also a major player in causing these arrhythmias. So vagotomy, you know, it's, it's, it's possible in some patients, but not all. So we want to also see if we can find some pharmacologic um, targets to also be able to treat people um, in the future. So, we did just that. Um, as you might know, acetylcholine receptors are both nicotinic and muscarinic. So we did the same thing, IV infusion three hours during hypoglycemia, vehicle control solution, muscarinic receptors, which we use AQRA741, which is a, um, it's mostly cardio selective. And then the nicotinic receptor, mecamylamine, which is an alpha three, beta four, um, which of the nicotinic subtypes, it's the N type. So it's mostly in the brain, also on the adrenal medulla, unfortunately that's going to affect the epinephrine levels. So interestingly, I thought mescarinic receptors would be more of a player in this, but they seem to not be. The mortality was not significantly reduced during severe hypoglycemia with muscarinic receptor blockers, but nicotinic blockers completely prevented mortality. 
And um, similar thing is seen with the arrhythmias, again, the main ones, second and third degree heart block, um, slightly reduced with muscarinic, but not significantly, completely prevented with nicotinic blocker. So acetylcholine must be working um, through the nicotinic blockers to, to cause these arrhythmias. So, sorry, the nicotinic receptors to, to cause arrhythmias during hypoglycemia. Is the um, um, conduction blocker, is that consistent with what you see in patients that suffer from hypoglycemia? So they've seen, yeah, but the hard part is, is you don't see too many because um, it's hard to get, unless someone has an ECG on a person that has severe hypoglycemia, okay. we're not going to see it. All right. Hypo more moderate hypoglycemia, people have done studies where they've sent them home with a Holter monitor and a continuous glucose monitor, yeah. see what happens day and night. Um, they definitely have, um, they have some heart block, more other ones are you know, PVCs and sure. why not? Okay. And it's definitely QT prolongation. All right, thanks. Yeah. What about just that? Yeah. So I tried that in the rats. It did not work either. Yeah, so that's when it was more specific. So I thought it might it might be a better choice to be more targeted. Um, didn't work either, so. So atrophy didn't even mimic muscarinic? It was, it was um, higher mortality. Really? Than muscarinic, but lower than control, but not, you know, not significant, huh. so. And again, looking at hormone levels, like I kind of alluded this to as well, compared to baseline, um, epinephrine and norepinephrine on the right here go up during severe hypoglycemia in both the control and muscarinic receptor ones. Unfortunately, nicotinic blocker did reduce both fat, blood, epinephrine and norepinephrine, which I mentioned might be a side effect because um, the receptor we're blocking is also on the adrenal gland, um, which is where epinephrine is secreted. So unfortunately, I say unfortunate because people with diabetes need epinephrine to combat hypoglycemia. So you never want to give someone with diabetes a drug that will reduce their epinephrine response. So another mechanistic thing, um, well, we'll have to find a better way to be able to target the uh, nicotinic receptors without affecting the epinephrine secretion. So um, I'm gonna talk about current studies in a second. I just wanna kind of summarize the last couple of slides I, I did for you guys. Um, that overall, our, this is our picture. Hypoglycemia um, does lead to QT prolongation, but I've kind of put it on the side up there because it's always there. Um, sometimes it's lessened but I don't really think it's a big player in, in what's happening later, which is heart block that leads to bradycardia and sudden death. We know that the brain um, detects hypoglycemia, which can innervate the heart, but can also innervate the adrenal gland, which leads to epinephrine and norepinephrine spill over into the blood, which can act back on the heart. So with ex vivo heart perfusion studies, we've shown that um, it is the autonomic innervation that you, you do need to cause these arrhythmias. Also shown that the beta adrenergic blockers particularly are the ones that are great at preventing the fatal heart block during hypoglycemia. And then vagotomy and then specifically nicotinic receptor blockers are the ones that also are major players at preventing arrhythmias. So conclusions from those studies are that elements from both sympathetic and parasympathetic seem to have this increased risk of severe hypoglycemia induced fatal cardiac um, arrhythmias or even heart block. It can change that not a heart block. Um, understanding the downstream mechanisms of this autonomic nervous system during severe hypoglycemia is needed to find these better treatments because I know a lot of these things are not going to be able to be fully translatable. So these are my, my biggest questions that I'm kind of going through right now on my current directions. I don't want to talk too much about it because, like I said, they are unpublished. Um, but one thing we are doing is since beta blockers work so well, it's like, okay, that's kind of a, a hint. Something's happening there. There, I think in my mind, in the more than 10 years I've been doing this, beta blocker seems to always just be that one that stood out the most. So norepinephrine came to mind too, because beta blockers can affect both epinephrine and norepinephrine. So it's norepinephrine's always there. What is it doing? If I look at blood um, over severe hypoglycemia, epinephrine spikes at the start of severe hypoglycemia in the blood, but then it drops down. So epinephrine actually stops being secreted at some point and norepinephrine is continually being increased during severe hypoglycemia. So norepinephrine might have a big role than we think. And so, so just a quick of what we've done so far, it's gonna be submitted for the American Diabetes Association next year. Um, we give norepinephrine to the brain of rats during hypoglycemia. And this is actually starting to increase their mortality compared to CSF controls. So norepinephrine might also be um, a big player. On the flip side, we did norepinephrine inhibitor, which stops these, um, norepinephrine from getting into terminals to be secreted from the um, nerve terminals. And so we block that and we can now, so far, are preventing mortality, which is actually already significantly prevented compared to control. So norepinephrine, I think, is um, going to be a, a, 
a big follow-up study for me. But lastly, I'm going to spend more time on this one because this is where I need some help. Um, downstream pathways. This is where I need to get more work done because there's inputs from both sides of the autonomic nervous system. What's happening that's common downstream that might be causing these arrhythmias to happen? One thing we targeted was calcium signaling. It was kind of a by accident, but we used a drug that worked and it happened to be a calcium channel blocker. And so we kind of went down that pathway and led to my ending receptors. And then part of my current R56 and future R01 submission is also trying to link the autonomic nervous system to these calcium channel signals. So again, um, I know I'm running out of time. So just briefly what these three things, um, I have three experiments we did that um, they they are they are submitted. Um, sorry, they're not submitted yet, but they are on publications from the conferences from the past couple of years for the Diabetes Association. But Rapamil, which is an L-type calcium channel blocker, I put a picture up here in case some people are um, forgetting where these calcium channels are located. But the L-type calcium channel, um, when you give an IV infusion for three hours in rats, rat mill completely prevents mortality compared to controls. So um, that led us to ask, well, what's downstream of that? We just want to keep going downstream. Downstream myanine receptors um, play a kind of a, a role in contraction and arrhythmia, uh, arrhythmic types. I know not specifically heart block, which is kind of interesting why we might even target that, but we decided to do it anyways. And JTV is a drug that stabilizes Randy receptors to make them not be so leaky and cause their potential arrhythmias. So we did an IV infusion during three hours in rats and found that they did completely prevent mortality. Since JTV though, it's a newer drug, it's not, uh, not FDA approved yet, um, and they're now, now finding more off-target effects than the Ryan receptor. So we, we asked, okay, well, let's, let's get a mouse. And I know um, with this mouse, it has an unsta unstable Ryan receptor with a mutation in it in the receptor itself, it still responds to JTV treatment. And so what we found was that in mice with this unstable Ryanian receptor as compared to wild type, this, this mouse model has increased mortality during three hours of severe hypoglycemia. Um, and they, they was pretty fast. I was shocked by that, but they are sensitive to epinephrine and whatnot too. So that may also be part of the player. But when we treated chronically with um, that drug JTV to stabilize the Ryanian receptors in these mice, there was no difference in mortality compared to wild type controls. So it did slightly reduce that mortality. So calcium channels, um, I think are um, more important than I had previously thought in this specific model. And um, if there's any input from you guys on um, any of the things you can think about with the calcium channels and how they might be involved in the different areas of the heart, especially the atrioventricular node, I'm all ears. Um, and I just like to stop by thanking all the members of my lab, which are, they're amazing undergraduates we get every year. Um, all you guys in CVRTI, Bruce made my EKG leads. He was amazing at that. Um, of course, Derek and Annie for their help with the heart perfusions. And my, my newer studies with um, Grace Stavros and Frank, um, they are helpful in getting those studies off the ground. And Dr. Fisher, who's now in Kentucky. Um, so uh, I do need help. <laughs> this is kind of a good platform for that, I think. EKG leads, um, Bruce was making them, and since he left, I've had a hard time finding a reliable source that can make good EKG leads, even though I have the whole, I have, I have how, exactly how to make them and what material to use. Um, if there's anybody has any insights in that, I'm, I'm all interested. Are you leading them connected? Like they're, they're connected with wires? They get, so there's wires and they get planted subcutaneously, and then they get, they get sewn up, and then on the day of the clamp, they get exposed and they get attached to a wire. Oh, okay. yeah. And I do have telemetry coming. Actually, I have a new, I'm excited. I got a new telemetry system that is oh, coming. Yeah. But yeah, um, plant, yeah, there's still, it's very expensive and there's not enough biosensors to do what I have in my lab. So I still need to make EKG leads for a backup system. But, um, and then isolating cardiac myocytes and testing randomness of productivity with calcium sparks. Um, Frank was helping me out with that. So if anybody has any ideas on how to continue that study, I'm, I'd be greatly appreciate it. And any other insights on testing Parasympathetic and sympathetic activity in vivo during hypoglycemia. Um, I have a bunch of setups in my lab that could potentially do it with, but again, I love advice or any other inputs on what you guys think about those kinds of studies. So, thank you. Well, thank, thank you for the great talk. Um, just real quick, if I could ask one thing. You, you talked about a lot about arrhythmia, block development, things like that. Have you looked at contractility at all. I mean, calcium or hypoglycemia uh, 
pressure. So we have done blood pressure, but not like we haven't done full on uh, 